The interdimensional garden party is a real achievement for Five. I mean, there's a real sense of maturity and refinement in his guitar playing, his compositions, and in particular his songwriting. And it's just a magical album. It, it, it twinkles from start to finish. It's, it's, uh, it's got that, that Fi magic, but it, it seems to be even like more uh, focused and intense, and, and it's just wonderful. It's always such a pleasure and, and a challenge to play his music because it's, um, it's, it involves a lot of rhythms and unusual melodies and uh, typical Fai Jansik. I mean, I, I love this stuff. So when you hear his music, you know, you can hear the influences there. Some of them are conspicuous. You can hear Frank Zappa, you can hear Steve Vai, but there are some other more difficult to decipher influences there. You have to understand that Fai grew up during the 1970s and 80s, so he would have been exposed to all those popular culturalisms of the time. You know, film soundtracks and popular TV music themes. It reminded me of uh, when I was a teenager, actually, and, and listening to some of the you know, progressive cornerstones of, of, the, of my life for the first time, and that, that feeling of discovery and, wow, I can't believe what I'm hearing. That's, that's the way this album hits me, so. Because I think that's what Fi has done um, with these albums, especially in more recent times. Rather than just being a guitarist and a composer that makes quirky, interesting guitar music, over the last few albums, he has been forging his own existence, right? He has created his, a, 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 like a, a parallel Fi world that we can all now in, enter into. We all know what inhabits that world. It's a really interesting world to go into. So I feel on this album, you know, this is this world that Fi has built over the last, you know, few albums. This is the invitation to that world for us all to go. And I wanted to start things off with a brief yet intense explosion of energy. So you can think of it as the musical equivalent of standing under a waterfall. So if you can imagine that immense volume and torrent of water pounding down. Uh, and so replace water with sound and you get an idea of what I was trying to evoke with this piece of music. On drums there's the whirlpool of energy that is Morgan Orgren, the remarkable fluid bass playing of Steve Lawson and longtime collaborator Lally Larson exploding notes out on, of the keyboard. He just told me to, you know, uh, just fill up every space and uh, just do this um, uh, sheets of sound kind of sound, you know. But also it's, it's the kind of piece that's this brief sound effect in one way. It gives me the, the sort of potential to take this album into any direction. It gives that sense of anticipation of what's gonna come next. So this is the title track from the album and is basically another explosion, this time of colour and vibrancy and is an extension of the themes uh, from the song Abigail's Place. So Abigail's Place came out in 2018 and was the sort of lead single from my double album Reality Is My Plaything. And if you watch the Abigail's Place video, you'll see a festive recreation of an interdimensional garden party going on. Hello, I'm Ellie Williams. I'm a musician and singer. I think the first track we actually did uh, vocals, my vocals on, was um, the interdimensional garden party. And uh, that, was, that was really hard because it was kind of just straight in uh, at the deep end. So it was tricky and it was, yeah, it was very, very challenging, but um, it was good fun. Superstar Christabel, Superstar Christabel will he prevail? Superstar Christabel, Superstar Chris, but he writes like a snail. So our protagonist in this piece of music is Superstar Christabel. And Superstar Chris 
is locked in this battle with the Archdemon of Time, or Kronos, if you will. And Kronos sits on Chris's shoulder and sows seeds of doubt and despair uh, as Chris attempts to write his magnum opus, his masterpiece, a book full of his knowledge and wisdom. So, so this whole piece of music is basically a creative exaggeration on those themes. So for a musical exaggeration, I needed to take a bombastic approach, specifically with the vocals, uh, to create this epic sound to convey the, the dramatic or melodramatic themes going on in the song. So I had Ellie Williams and Rob Grocutt helping out with additional layers in the verse and choruses. And basically, we just did layers and layers of overdubs to create this huge, bombastic vocal sound. The main inspiration for this piece musically was Kevin Gilbert's Shadow Self. And that's one of my all-time favorite pieces of music. So this is like a little homage to the, the genius and talent of Kevin Gilbert. In celebration of all things Bigfoot, so this piece needed to be big, heavy and bold with massive riffs and massive drums and massive bass to kind of complement the idea of the Sasquatch stomping around in the forest. So a song about Bigfoot needs big riffs and big drums. So drummer Andy Edwards was at one point a member of Robert Plant's band and you can imagine he's more than capable of uh, delivering the kind of big, solid, heavy, John Bonham style drum grooves that such a song as this requires. This was the reason why I did the album. You know, when Fi rang me up and he said, do you want to play on the album? I was like, I don't know, Fi, I mean, uh, what, what, what's the carrot that you're dangling? There's got to be a carrot that you need to dangle. And Fi, but, dangled a very big, Bigfoot-shaped carrot, and that he told me that I would be able to make a song with Bigfoot, who I'm a massive fan of, you know. And I thought, I really want to appear on an album with Bigfoot. I I'll show you, I've got a few things here. I've got, um, I've got Bigfoot's book, you see? There's Bigfoot's book, written by Bigfoot. We might have some photos of Bigfoot in here. Look, there's, there's photographs of his big feet there. It's incredible. And he's also joined uh, on bass by uh, his longtime friend and collaborator, John Jowett. So Andy and John have played together in, in many bands. They're uh, currently in the band Rain uh, and have played previously in Frost and IQ together. So having John there as well, complimenting and locking into Andy adds, adds the perfect rhythm section to, to uh, to form the foundation for my wild guitar playing. Um, I've also got other books on Bigfoot. Here, I pulled another one out. Um, Sasquatch, The Legend Meets Science. This song, uh, it, it, it's funny. It, it seems like half of it is like Fi's version of like a straight up pop rock song, which of course is never going to be a straight up version of a pop rock song. And the choruses are even kind of like a like a straight up rock. So it kind of maybe lulls you into a false sense of security there before it makes that very very sharp left turn halfway through and goes into that long odyssey section which essentially carries it all the way to the end there's a lot of harmonic complexity that's going on in the end of this song uh, and the bass is pedaling these bass notes which you know you kind of just have to trust the composer uh, with something that's so harmonically complex there's so much going on over top and my job is just to be do 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 through it all it's all kind of like slightly bent because it's not in the context of a traditional rock song or rock chorus. The context of it is this very, very strange tapestry 
which is a, a big part of the thing that I think Fi is building just about every one of his compositions. This this is the thing I love about Fi, is it's not the usual, some funky grooves, some nice odd time signatures, some tasty playing. Fi takes you into a world, and that world is a sort of, um, it can be at times, a, a, a a fairy folk world, it can be a, at times a sort of insta interstellar world, it can be a gothic world, you know, populated with Victorian ghosts, with backstories which make your hair stand on the back, up on the back of your neck. And I think this is the territory that Fi's going in here, and it seems to be about some sort of erotic female spiritual presence. I haven't got a clue what it's about. Wickety wickety, that's the song is about that kind of feeling. The groove is kind of like a, a, a like a dark circus, you know, or barren, or like a circus from hell, but also feels like a little bit like a New Orleans New Orleans funeral dirge kind of just gone wrong or something. If you were to meditate on this world that Fire's created and you were to enter into that world guided by your spirit animal animus, right? I'm pretty sure if Fi was to do that, it would definitely be one of the pink elephants from Dumbo, okay? That would be the doorway into the world. Anyone who's seen Dumbo will know exactly what I mean. And I think, um, this track is like the doorway into that world and channels that world. And so uh, I used my Spectre Alex Webster signature bass and I recorded a dirty channel, which I always do. And this is the, uh, the Dark Glass Alpha Omega. So that's where that distortion that you hear in the bass. Uh, and Fi used a liberal amount of that, as it turns out, in the final mix. And, uh, and that's kind of what propels the song through. It's, it's, um, it's a, a style of music, the Elephants on Parade music, is a style of music which has not been explored that much by the jazz fusion and progressive rock world. I, I, I can't recall Alan Holdsworth or Scott Henderson or Guthrie Govan exploring that world, but here Fi does. And um, on this, Fi has allowed me to represent the interdimensionality of these parallel worlds through the use compositionally of metrically relatable opposing tempos. The song's really divided into four quadrants. You know, you've got uh, the first part, which establishes the groove, and then those melody breaks. The... And what happens is they keep coming back, but then suddenly they start coming at you from like all weird, unexpected angles. They're shorter, they're longer, they start on offbeats. It's one of those things that, as a sideman, someone who's not the composer, obviously the composer knows how the song goes. But uh, if you're hired to play the song as a session musician, uh, to be able to do it in parts and then put it all together and then listen back to it at the end uh, will help you make sense of the song because there's a lot going on there. So then you get into the second part where the groove stays the same but the harmonic quality gets darker. Uh, where this melody starts going over top of it. And that gives the drummer the opportunity to do all sorts of metric modulations. Right, so if you imagine a track has the, is in this tempo, that's the speed of the track, and the track's traveling on along in at, at that speed, that's the world you're in. The tempo of the track is the, the, the fundamental determiner, it's the material in which that track exists. Every note, every phrase has to drop onto that grid, onto that grid of time. And that points towards the great mystery of music, which, which takes the spatial and channels the spatial along the temporal. Right, but within those tempos could exist parallel tempos, almost like parallel worlds, parallel universes. And most of the time in music, we're not aware they're there, but Fi allows me to explore those worlds. And it doesn't happen very often on, in, a, in a musical track, but on um, Sasquatch Stomp and Wickety Wickety, Wickety Wickety, Wickety Wickety, I get to explore those worlds. And I feel that this is something that 
Fi and myself have done on a couple of other albums, but especially on this album, which is our own little unique um, uh, contribution to the music world. You know, people like Frank Zappa and Cardiacs and other bands that we absolutely love, they've explored, explored it, but not quite in the way that I think Fi and I have explored it, which is a sort of um, part in improvisational and part structural. And then the outro is like a jam on the main groove, which is like the whole song is kind of very controlled and very composed. And then for the end of it, I, I, I wanted to really loosen it up and kind of give it like a different kind of energy. Uh, and so I just kind of treated it like it was like a really, really bent blues shuffle. Like, This is one of three tracks that was recorded at Urchin Studios in London with the fabulous drummer Matt Ingram. And they formed the, uh, the initial seed that sparked off the rest of this album. Um, so May the Star Shine Through You was instrumentally completed many years back and it's just lying on a shelf there waiting for the right lyrics to arrive so it took me a while and several different iterations to come up with the the, the lyrical theme for this song the narrative to may the stars shine through you is really interesting i guess it reflects uh, five thoughts on society and technological advancements our engagement with technology how it modifies our behavior somewhat um, and so there's a sense of despair, but also one of hope. And I suppose the inspiration came from, I guess, me coming up with a neo-gnostic alternative version of the Star Wars phrase or the Jedi greeting, uh, may the force be with you. And out of all the songs on the album, I suppose it's the most conventional in terms of its structure. You know, there's a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, and outro. Um, but the chorus, you know, exhibits the usual uh, twists and turns that you find in uh, Fi's music. And, and there's a wonderful ending to this piece. It's really powerful and anthemic. Um, musically quite melancholic, but lyrically uh, hopeful. Flying Sorcery was a lovely surprise uh, for me. Um, I have different methods of composing. Uh, sometimes I just compose directly into Sibelius, the uh, sort of scoring software that I use. Sometimes it's taking up the guitar and recording a bunch of riffs together. But with Flying Sorcery it was a case of, I had some drums from Morgan, which I had some ideas for but they weren't sort of set in stone. And so I basically composed a piece of music around these drums, uh, trying different ideas out of what would fit with each section. And then I just had the idea of, how about adding some vocals to really pull all this together? And uh, when Ellie was here, we kind of went down this B-52s rock lobster kind of <laughs> singing direction where she indulged all my crazy vocal ideas. Flying Sorcery was really hard because just the way the, the melody was moving for me and also remembering all these words which Fai had written I think that morning had just written them out on a sticky note what he wanted me to do and kind of just decided about 10 minutes before what I would be singing um, so trying to learn that and also think of these melodies there's so many different things going on so you never doing just one thing. Um, it's never just kind of the same thing over and over. It's always something different to work with. So, and just a lot of fun. A 
Anomaly Temporal is totally a groove piece. Um, it's about just getting a funky groove down and contrasting it with a B section that's a bit more cinematic and based around an augmented tonality. We have amazing funky drumming from Matt Ingram, Lali Larson playing uh, electric piano on there, and then narration, the icing on the cake, the narration by Mike Keneally, uh, narrating a poem that I wrote. The basic song is based on this poem that was in itself inspired by an episode of the uh, British sci-fi comedy series called Red Dwarf. And in particular, there's this famous episode called Backwards. And so, yeah, inspired by that, I wanted to write a poem that the second verse is the first verse backwards in terms of the word order, not phonetically. <laughs> Otherwise, it'd be even stranger, but I might try that one day. So the question that is on everybody's mind is what is your favorite UFO? What is my favorite UFO? We all have our favorite UFOs. I, well, we should do, if, even if you haven't thought about it that much. So what is your favorite UFO? Is it secret military tech? Is it ET spacecraft? Is it crypto terrestrial spacecraft? Is it ultra terrestrial dimensional? beings? Is it plasma creatures lurking in the upper atmosphere? Or is it just swamp gas or misidentification of the planet Venus? Um, so <laughs> these and many other questions are answered in this piece of music, maybe or maybe not. My favourite UFO is to achieve the real careful balance between you know, sweet lyrical melodies and hyperactive rhythmic activity. I don't know, it's really interesting contrast there. I love the way it begins. It's a very pretty introduction. And uh, Fi is obviously singing through um, a vocoder, so you get this robotic sounding voice that's followed by this, the most beautiful sounding female vocal melody line. There's some really interesting uh, textural contrasts in the piece. And uh, a great example of how Fi manages to take disparate elements and put them together. Just when you think it's straight, or it just goes duh, 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 duh. and then suddenly it's got all those weird chord changes uh, where you go, uh, let's go through this doorway. And then it's like <laughs> super, super strange chords. And that gets you through the first two verses and then it gets to this middle section, which is just really, really kind of wild. But it's wild, but also it's kind of whimsical because I like the way that the chords kind of wind around. Uh, until they get to the uh, until the really weird part, the the, the tritones, the dun, 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 and then it goes through a really kind of Zappa-esque through composed thing. But the chords over the five four bit that lead into that, uh, I really like the way that they join. And uh, I'm I'm always you know when you're writing songs, whenever I hear uh, unusual progressions that kind of like uh, deliver an emotional message without relying on any of the usual. Uh, chord trademark turnarounds or signposts I think is very cool and by the end of it I mean the thing is moving so fast it's hard to believe that the whole band is is sticking together I don't know if I meant for that to kind of emulate like you know the UFO is like taking off and like starting to like gain speed as it heads towards outer space or something like that it's just a fiesta and hence it was uh, my choice for the f first video from the from this album um, a kind of continuation of Abigail's Place and um, little UFO link in that video too. We shot a video for that song and uh, hopefully you'll get to see some of the uh, wacky goings on of the characters who were responsible for, for pulling that whole thing off. A great excuse to wear pajamas. So floating brings the album down to a slower, calmer pace and was a track originally um, recorded for the Reality Is My Plaything album. 
So it features Brian Bella on bass, Marco Miniman on drums, and Mike Keneally uh, for the first guitar solo. I mean, nobody sounds like Mike Keneally when you, when he's soloing it, and, and it's this kind of like all the ideas that he have just that he has just kind of come out of left field, and he's always hitting you with something that you uh, that you don't expect. So floating never made it onto the uh, Reality Is My Plaything album due to a technical glitch in the recorded drum tracks. Uh, fortunately enough, uh, I was able to rectify that issue for this album, and um, it's great that this piece finally sees the light of day, uh, especially as I have lots of fond memories of recording it at Double Time Studios. I had completely forgotten about this jam uh, and this song from the sessions that we did in uh, in double time all those years ago it came back to me slowly as I was listening to it I just I just hadn't thought or heard about this piece of music that we did in, in over 10 years uh, I immediately recognized the sound of my old Mike Lowell modern 5 red bass which unfortunately was stolen in in 2016 it's got this really kind of bright uh, aggressive but also kind of beautiful uh, upper mids and, and, and highs and uh, in the mix of the song I'm realizing that uh, that Phi really left a lot of that untouched like really allowed a lot of that kind of color and character uh, of the instrument to shine through. I remember we did quite a number of takes of, of this piece um, mainly to get the the tempo right. I think initially we were playing it way too fast and it didn't quite feel right until finally we settled into the the right slow groove, uh, which is a, quite a contrast to my other hectic, frenetic stuff. The other cool thing about it is that uh, I can hear the layers of uh, Lally Larson's keyboard and uh, and Pi's extra guitar on there as the thing starts moving along. Uh, so it really kind of turns into something more than it originally was. It was actually a live recording without uh, any click or anything because Marco and Brian and Fi and Mike Keneally had already recorded and so I had to overdub the, the keys afterwards um, and it was quite different and it, it sounds very organic just because it doesn't have this click track and I actually sometimes I prefer that because then I can just listen to the drums and pretty much do a first take, that's usually the best because then you listen and you're fresh. It's just like playing in a room basically, you hear, you react to what you hear. And to have it come back roaring through the speakers, you know, with all the energy and all the vibe of that time that we did it, uh, you know, kind of all at once is a super trippy experience. So, you know, I hope that people really, really dig. I think this is one of the last artifacts of that little era there that me and Marco and Mike Keneally and, and Fly we were recording that in San Diego all those years ago. I want to tell you about the puffball that ate my village. Has your village ever been eaten by a giant puffball mushroom? Well, this can sometimes happen in these here parts of the UK. And this is a piece of music written about that very such occurrence. This piece, probably the oldest piece on, on the album in the sense that it came out originally in 2007 on the Alchemist 2 guitar compilation album, which I also uh, produced and mastered. He asked me to play on a track called um, The Puffball That Ate My Village, which is a very interesting track. It was actually a little bit more quirky with this sort of hoppy, skippy beat. Not the usual sort of rhythms you'd, you'd um, expect from guitar music or, say, progressive rock or jazz fusion. It was his own world. And I, little did I know I was act, actually entering into Fire's world at that point. And Fi has taken that very track and he has embellished it. He has um, expanded on it. He has um, mystified it. Or demystified it. I don't know which one he's done actually. 
So taking the original drum parts from Andy Edwards, the piano parts from Lale, and my guitar parts, I was able to add some uh, brass from Brian Corbett, and Steve Lawson added some new bass parts. So fortunately, Steve knew the song really well because he'd been part of the uh, the live band uh, that had performed this track in concert so uh, he had the chops down to play it and uh, did an amazing job you know adding a solid foundation to the riff as well as following all the quirky rhythmic changes that that happen in this piece so my contribution to the album was um, a guitar solo in the track The Puffball That Ate My Village. Uh, Fire invited me to play solo on that. And it was a great opportunity because we had a chance to trade off uh, solos and it's kind of a call and response thing, I suppose. And uh, it was just great to have a recording where we were both uh, playing together. So I really enjoyed that experience. And I'm very proud to be able to come in and put my drumming to that because so often we get bogged down, especially with instrumental music, in the technical. But great instrumental music is able to rise above the technical, and the way it rises above the technical is with the story. <laughs> I remember the butt butt bars. Mm. Oh, I remember the butt butt bars. Yeah. Yeah,